patient. My name is Pat Sheehan, and we are talking today about health and wellness, uh, a topic that's going to be very important upcoming in the spring and summer with ACB. With me today, I have Beta Tareen, who is with the Office of Civil Rights with uh, Health and Human Services. He's going to be speaking to us in a few minutes. I think, as we all know, Health and Human Services, is HHS, is, has been vitally important over the last year. Uh, the Centers for the Disease Control, uh, NIH, uh, Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are all part of HHS. They hold a, uh, a large uh, part of the responsibility for getting information to us uh, about what's going on with respect to the pandemic, uh, the data that comes out of CDC, lots of areas that we are concerned about uh, in ACB. Uh, today, I have the great pleasure of working with uh, Beta Turin. Uh, he went to law school in North Carolina, uh, law degree from Chapel Hill. Uh, he served uh, at, uh, at HUD at the, uh, there for a few years and then went over to Department of Justice where he was, received uh, awards for his work and now is working at HHS. So, Bader, thank you for finding me, for being patient, uh, getting back to this call today. Uh, Office of Civil Rights, uh, Mr. Terrain, uh, welcome to ACB. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Thanks for that introduction, and I'm glad that your name is now listed as Pat. Uh, before, there were two other Terrains, so I just want to make sure we know which one is which. Uh, but thank you for introducing me. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here at ACB. Uh, I've been very, very excited. So I know we're running a little late. Apologies on my end. I, I got the wrong link. So don't worry. I won't uh, cut anything. We'll, I'll speed it along, but I'll make sure everything I was going to talk about will be talked about, and I'll make sure there'll be time for Q&As as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So once again, my name is Bother Tareen. I'm a civil rights analyst and attorney at the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So first, I want to go over a little bit about HHS Office for Civil Rights, uh, the work we do, some of the legal authorities we, assert, we enforce, just to get some background of what we are and what we do. Number two, I'm going to talk a lot about our enforcement uh, particularly with uh, disability and accessibility during the uh, pandemic of COVID-19. And then three, I'm going to talk about some other civil rights enforcement work we've done uh, aside from the pandemic that was fairly recent. After that, I'm happy to open up for questions and answers, and I'll answer your questions the best I can. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So HHS Office for Civil Rights, we're actually headquartered in Washington, D.C. I, I understand that all of you are all over the place right now. Uh, I guess that's the great part of remote technology, but our office headquarters is in DC, but we have regional offices throughout the country. So we have offices in California and Texas, in the Midwest, on uh, the East Coast, uh, Southeast. So all over the country, we have uh, at least about over about 10 regional offices uh, in addition to our headquarters office. OCR is comprised of three different divisions. There's a civil rights division, that's me, that's where I work out of. Uh, there's a HIPAA privacy and there is the conscience, religious and freedom division. But I'm, today I'm gonna be talking about my division, that's civil rights. So what do we do? Uh, we do a lot of work at the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Rights Division. We uh, do largely enforcement or enforcement agency. I'll talk a little bit about what that means, but in essence, what we do is we receive complaints from the general public and we investigate those. A lot of the on-ground on -ground investigation is actually done by the regional offices, but we at headquarters often sometimes are involved in some of the bigger cases or give management or consultations for those investigations. We also do other kinds of investigations that don't necessarily need a complaint. Uh, there are these uh, types of reviews called compliance reviews. So if there are a lot of issues coming out of the press or just a lot of concerns we're hearing from advocates, we could look into that entity to see if there are civil rights compliance concerns. So for example, uh, the year before last, we launched the uh, Title IX and 
5057 sex, sexual harassment uh, review of many healthcare university centers. So for example, MSU, Michigan State University, where Dr. Larry Nasser worked, that's where we did a compliance review. There wasn't necessarily a complaint filed list, but we were able to investigate uh, given the number of concerns that were raised. So we do a lot of enforcement. Number two, we do outreach. So a lot of these types of events, presentations, uh, I run another outreach program called the Medical Schools Curriculum Initiative, where we talk to pre-dental, pre-medical um, uh, pre college students about civil rights requirements. And that includes, of course, effective communication. And then, of course, we do policy. We write regulations, we do policy bulletins, and so forth. So that's kind of the things that we do, enforcement, outreach, and policy guidance. Now, I'm guessing some of you might be a little bit con um, not concerned, but more about curious about how does our complaint process work? Well, I'll just, I'll give it to you straight. So what, what happens is anybody can file complaints with HHS Office for Civil Rights, anyone from the general public, even if you yourself did not face the alleged discrimination, you could be filing on behalf of someone else. Um, these complaints can be filed by email or by actual snail mail. Uh, and what we do is we receive these complaints. And the first thing we check for is, are there actual civil rights allegations alleged under our laws are there, is there alleged allegations against an entity that we have jurisdiction over, right? So if it's a complaint against Jiffy Lube, we don't really have jurisdiction over Jiffy Lube. We typically have jurisdiction over entities that get funds from us, HHS, and those uh, entities tend to be health and human service providers. So we check for that type of jurisdiction. Uh, you want to make sure that the complaint is filed timely. So it should be filed within 180 days of when the complainant knew or maybe should have known about the allegation uh, involved. And then once we kind of look at those, we have a review process. So a lot of those complaints are reviewed. Some of them might be closed because there might not be jurisdiction. If there is jurisdiction, we will review it. We will contact the complainant to interview, get more information. If need be, we will contact the entity to see what we can uh, ascertain. And a lot, of our a lot of these complaints actually are resolved voluntarily. Uh, many times we find that covered entities want to do the right thing. It's just a matter of maybe educating them about the laws and the compliance. Uh, many times we, when we do need to get resolution, oftentimes it's just a matter of changing a covered entity's policies or procedures or providing more training or education to them about civil rights requirements. Um, there can be instances where there's formal enforcement that doesn't happen very often where we might have to involve the Department of Justice that almost very rarely happens. So that's kind of what the complaint process looks like, but what, what laws do we enforce? So we enforce a number of laws. Uh, I think with respect to disability, there are really about four that I think are really relevant for today. The major enforcement authorities are one, and I'm sure many of you know about this already, uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, that, of course, prohibits discrimination on disability, like all these authorities do. And those really apply to recipients of federal financial assistance, that's HHS funds like us, uh, and other federally conducted programs, so federally, like federal government programs. Uh, the other authority we also enforce is Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, 1990. Uh, and that similarly applies, just like 504, about disability protections, very similar. Uh, but those apply more to state and local government entities. And three, we have Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. That also prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability, among others. And that really applies to certain types of health programs or activities. Um, for example, those that get federal financial assistance, the marketplaces, uh, and, and so forth. So that's kind of the, the main ones. Now, within all those authorities, they all have very similar provisions on effective communication. There are other types of disability uh, requirements, but I think for our purposes today, effective communication is pretty darn important. And that's really, of course, as you, I'm sure you all know, it's about taking appropriate steps to ensure that uh, communications with someone, uh, particularly individuals with disabilities, are as effective as communications with others. And this can often mean providing these auxiliary aids and services. So that could be, of course, providing braille, uh, large print materials, and audio descriptions, and so forth. Uh, another really important authority, this is the last one I'm going to talk about, is Section 508. Uh, I'm sure many of you have, have heard that. It's very important. It basically requires our federal agencies to ensure that uh, individuals with disabilities um, have comparable access to use of electronic information technology. So let's go over a couple examples. 
I've talked to, to Pat about this a little bit too, and we're, we've been hearing that the CDC has done some good work uh, with respect to 508, for example, uh, taking on visual graphs and charts and putting descriptions about those charts and graphs uh, that some of their videos, or at least all of them that we know of so far that are relevant are narrated in a way so a person who might be visually impaired can get sort of the same experience as someone uh, who is not. Uh, so that's an, uh, examples of things that can be helpful. Uh, NIH is National Cancer Institute um, has been, to our knowledge, been taking some of their documents and media to make them more compliant with Section 508. So those are some examples that I think that are helpful. So, so far, we've talked about HHS OCR, who we are, what we do, our complaint process, and there are four kind of main disability authorities. That's the first part of my presentation. Two, now we're going to get into some actual specific work that we've done uh, with respect to disability discrimination during the COVID-19 pandemic. So basically within the last year, what have we done? What are some of the works that is relevant? Well, first off the bat, right away, um, towards the end of March in 2020, when this was just considered to be a global pandemic, right away, our office issued out a bulletin on that indicating basically that, hey, civil rights requirements, they remain in effect during a pandemic. They are not somehow canceled out or superseded or forgotten about. We are still enforcing and we are open for business. And in that bulletin, we specifically talked about providing effective communication uh, for those who, again, who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, have low vision, speech disabilities, and qualified interpreters, picture boards, and other means. And I normally wouldn't talk about bulletins. Or not, I mean, bulletins are always important, but these were particularly important because that bulletin sent a message to the community, civil rights community, other federal agencies, and so forth about we're here, we're open for business, these reigns in effect. And I really think that was a critical bulletin. It really set the pace and helped us get more complaints during the COVID-19 um, era that we were still in. Uh, in addition to that civil rights bulletin, we've issued several others, of course, on race, color, national origin, and helping those who are limited English proficient. But that one that talked a bit about disability and effective communication was the first, because it is critical. Uh, you might be thinking about, well, what complaints have you received during COVID-19? We received a number of them. Uh, particularly those who um, have affected parties or complainants who are blind or have a visual impairment, we received mostly effective communication complaints. Uh, for example, we've seen some complaints about individuals who maybe weren't uh, allegedly included for a COVID-19 vaccine trial uh, because they were blind or uh, other ones where people had difficulty accessing medical treatment, uh, again, because they were blind. So we did receive some of those complaints. I can't get too much into details about them. I just wanted to give you kind of a general idea of what we're seeing on the ground for COVID-19. But I can tell you about more about the successful complaints that are done, because that's more public knowledge. So we have a lot of different kinds of cases. The one big kind of case um, were the visitation cases. This is a pretty big deal. This was in June of 2020. We received a complaint that alleged the state of Connecticut had statewide guidance that basically said hospitals can't have any visitors or no visitor policies uh, during COVID-19 with very narrow exceptions that basically ended up excluding a lot of individuals with disabilities. So a lot of people with disabilities couldn't get visitors in hospitals. And the complaint alleged, well, wait a second, a lot of individual disabilities need support persons uh, for, for various reasons and other types of assistance that would make that difficult. So we worked closely with the state of Connecticut and came to a resolution. The state of Connecticut actually changed and issued a brand new executive order after we worked with them. And it basically said that individuals with disabilities, hey, they have to have reasonable access to support persons in hospital settings. And it specifically said that it permitted the entrance of a designated support person for a patient with a disability. Um, it could be a family member, service providers, or other individuals knowledgeable um, with that person while they're um, at the hospital. And in fact, if they're in that hospital setting for longer than just one day, uh, that person can designate at least two support persons uh, to come with that person with disability, but you can only have one person at a time. So, but still, it was a way of making sure that we're in compliance with our civil rights authorities while ensuring that we're balancing, of course, the importance of safety. The another time of really important case that we've been working on are the critical uh, standard of care cases, CSC as we call them. So in, in essence, uh, there are a lot of cases that we received about roughly about seven or so 
where we had allegations against an entire statewide critical standard of care plan, CSC plan. And those plans basically talk about how a state is going to allocate resources when there is an emergency like the COVID-19 pandemic. And there were some allegations that several states had these older CSC plans that were written a long time ago, basically that would essentially unlawfully disqualify persons with disabilities from care. So there were allegations saying that, look, are indicating that these assessment tools for the CSC plans are deprioritizing personal disabilities, therefore not getting treatment uh, because of that. So immediately we work with these states and some of these states include Alabama, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah, to change those CSC plans to make sure they're compliant and not leaving out persons with disabilities. So right away, here's some of the takeaways we got from the CSC plans. Here's some of the changes we made. One, that resource allocations, they can't really be based, they have to be based on some type of individualized assessment. That's important, everyone's different. Uh, and these assessments can't be based on any kind of categorical exclusion. So you can't just say, well, okay, while well, you're disabled, so now you're gonna be off the list of priority for um, critical care. Can't do that. Um, can't have these sort of evaluations of a person's relative life worth or quality of life judgments. That would be uh, not compliant. Uh, such, you know, these assessments of who can get care can't deprioritize people on the basis of disability just because they might consume more treatment resources or because they need auxiliary agent services. That's something that also is not permitted. So these are pretty big changes that we hope are going to lead to more accessible medical care. Um, so that, that's some of the cases we've worked on uh, in the COVID-19 era that are pretty relevant. I should also talk about some of the working groups that we're on. Uh, I'm very lucky to be on at least two of them, but my colleagues are in others, uh, that specifically talk about civil rights, uh, access to care during COVID-19. So for example, I'm in a group with FEMA, and that FEMA work group basically is focused on vaccines and specifically equitable distribution of vaccines that will make sure that vaccines are being distributed to all types of communities fairly under the law. Uh, and so I meet with that group three times a week. So we're getting up-to-date issues. I'm with, and this working group is CDC, um, FEMA, myself, and from HHS OCR, Department of Justice, all types of groups three times a week talking about these issues and trying to get find solutions. So we might have a meeting and someone will say, well, you know, we've had these issues with uh, accessibility. You know, there wasn't sign language interpretation on this video. Uh, there wasn't large uh, print or there wasn't a language assistance uh, for those who are limited English proficient. And then we will talk about it and actually try to solve it and get the right people on it. So that's a pretty big group. Another group that we we're on, and I'm on at least, is the Department of Justice. COVID uh, enforcement uh, sort of civil rights group. So that's a group where we meet and talk about civil rights issues generally in COVID. The FEMA group is a little bit more focused on vaccines, but the, the DOJ one, that's just more broad. So we're on working groups. We're, we're trying to listen on the ground uh, to do more work that we hope can make a real difference in enforcing our laws. So that's part two of my presentation. So we just talked about who we are, what we do at OCR, some of our COVID-19 enforcement work with respect to disability. And now three, this is the last part. I know I'm coming a little bit closer on time, so I'll go a little bit quicker, but it's basically just our relative, other relevant disability work. So some of you might be familiar with CMS, that's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And there were some complaints from DREDF, the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, uh, with respect to their compliance with Section 504. Uh, and there were some subsequent complaints within that issue uh, from the National Federation of the Blind as well. Uh, there's a complaint filed in district court. And basically, there was a settlement agreement on that issue in 2018 and 2019. CMS did some more work. And I'm bringing this up because we at OCR uh, work with, OC with CMS on these improvements to ensure more accessibility uh, for individuals uh, with auxiliary agent services. So what does that mean? Well, some of these changes are that one, CMS is now has uh, more of a process for individuals with disabilities to get auxiliary aid and services from CMS. So again, Medicare, Medicaid services, uh, there's a means in which you can call 1-800-MEDICARE number, the marketplace call center to get those auxiliary aid and services. Um, their commitments to providing notices of non-discrimination uh, on the auxiliary aids, training requirements for CMS, uh, Medicare contractors on 504 requirements, 
CMS did their own sort of 504 self-assessment and developed sort of a long-term action plan to be more compliant. So some good work was done and that was pretty recent, about 2019 and the end of May. So not, not too long ago. And then another work I wanna just mention, the last thing is child welfare. I know we're here primarily to talk about healthcare and that's very important, but we also do child welfare work at the Department of Health and Human Services into the type of human service. And one of the big cases that we recently worked on was with the Department of Justice, HHS and DOJ. Uh, we reached a pretty landmark agreement with the state of Massachusetts, um, with the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families. And this was in November, 2020, so just a few months ago. And basically the, the agreement resolved a number of issues. So the, we, they received a number of complaints, the Massachusetts Department of Families, that parents with physical, hearing, uh, developmental and other types of disabilities uh, were not provided with reasonable modifications, effective communication, and just an equal opportunity to benefit in these programs and services uh, for, again, the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families. So this impacts people with disabilities. So uh, at this point, we are, um, we work with them. We actually signed a compliance a settlement agreement with DOJ, HHS, and Massachusetts Department of Children. Uh, and one of those agreements provisions talks about that uh, individual disabilities will receive um, equal opportunity to participate, regain child custody of their children, effective communication requirements, and so forth. So again, that was a big victory. We're very happy that we were able to be a part of it. So in summary, HHS OCR, we do enforcement, we do outreach, we do policy. Number two, we do a number of COVID-19 enforcement work uh, with visitation cases, CSC cases. Uh, we do a number of different groups with the federal partners to kind of see what's on going on on the ground, solve problems. And three, we also do a lot of other disability work uh, that isn't necessarily linked to COVID-19, but still very important, including child welfare. Um, and of course, with CMS. So that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, what I was here to talk about. And I hope that was a little helpful, but I'm happy here to answer some questions if, uh, if I can uh, provide some more light on any issues. Very good, sir. Excellent presentation. I do appreciate it. Very nicely done. Do we have any questions? Hey, yes. We have we Alice might. Richard first. Beautiful. Alice, you should be able to unmute, Alice. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. My, my question is, um, you, you said early on with the COVID that one of the things was that people in the hospital were allowed or should be allowed to have visitors. If that's the case, because I happen to know for a fact when my brother went in who was totally blind, his wife was not allowed in at all and he had had a stroke. And so even trying to communicate with staff and it was an issue, but they would not and absolutely refused to let his wife in. Um, she had to sit out in the parking lot basically at the hospital. So if, if things like that happen, where do people send their complaints? And then my second thing is, when, because you said you've been working on the issue with Medicare, my thing is, now, I do have an Advantage plan, and the team that does my Advantage plan is real good about sending stuff in an alternate format. But whenever I get anything directly from Medicare, it still comes in print, which to me is nothing but uh, fireplace burning um, because it does me no good. So I just wonder if we're ever going to get Medicare to fall in line with Social Security and actually provide stuff in an alternate format when they send it out. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the question. I really appreciate it. So let's go with the first one. So your first question was about the visitation issues. So you, said, you mentioned an anecdote where someone uh, was not able to get their spouse to visit them uh, while they were in receiving medical care. Um, so yes, a part of um, Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights would be an office that you could certainly file a complaint with on that. That doesn't, I should clarify that um, the law doesn't say that you always must always get a visitor at all times, every time for every person, uh, but that could be a form of a reasonable modification to get a visitor with you if, if the circumstances are proper or even if it's just video, uh, some type of video kind of communication or some other type of reasonable modification, maybe visitors at some times, 
whatever the case may be, it depends on the facts. So I don't want to guarantee that every single time uh, there would be a requirement to always have a visitor, but it could be the case that there were, they were entitled to one. So I would definitely encourage uh, to, if this person wants to, or anyone else wants to file on their behalf to file with us, of course. Um, the hospital, of course, will probably have some kind of complaint, complaint department as well, but you can certainly file with us. That would likely be under our jurisdiction since it's a health provider. Uh, the second question was about a CMS uh, and that sometimes they don't provide uh, materials uh, in alternate formats. Uh, I would say that, that I hope they, they should. Um, I would hope that um, one of the things to do, I would hope is if, if it hasn't been done already is to of course contact CMS or their um, call center uh, and to see if they can, they can change that. Uh, can always file a complaint if if uh, that's not being resolved but hopefully internally that could work out but uh, yeah um, thank you for your question and I think someone else has their hand up Melanie Brunson hello thank you very much for being here um, I have a couple of questions about the accessibility of the COVID vaccine process um, I've been hearing complaints about from a lot of people who are having trouble even getting signed up to get the vaccines because the websites um, time out more quickly than they can get the forms filled out. And I know is that several people who have managed to complete the process um, in a couple of different states have had concerns because they were sent to locations that were 50, 75 miles from their homes. And they, in, in uh, one case, the person wasn't able to get their vaccine because they couldn't get there. And in another case, the person did have access to a, uh, a driver who could take them. But these are both big concerns for a lot of us who would be eligible for the, the vaccine, but are having running into barriers. So my question is, is this something that your office um, can help us to work through with the various states? Well, thanks for the question. Um, if do you do for this, for these concerns that you raise, and they seem very important about timing out so a person can't uh, get into the system properly and register to be vaccinated or um, certain uh, locations, maybe not uh, being diff difficult to access. Uh, that depends on the covered entity, but it might be more of a FEMA, Department of Homeland Security issue because they do on the ground disaster. There's some overlap with what we do and they do, but um, if you have specific uh, states or a little more details, I could certainly pass that along. Uh, if, you, if you could tell me what states or regions or if you had more specific information, I could pass it along to that FEMA working group. I'm scheduled to be in a meeting tomorrow and they're going to ask me, have you heard anything? So um, is there more specifics you can, you can share with me? Uh, just a second. Sure. Yeah, of course. I, uh, sorry about that, Melody. Go ahead and unmute. Or Melanie. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I no problem. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're quick on the tr trigger there um, <laughs> with, with good reason. Uh, but yes, uh, Florida um, and Texas are two places that I've, I'm have i aware where there's been problems. Okay. And the problems are that when the people try to register online for the vaccine, the system kind of times out really quickly. Yeah, before they can get the process finished. Um, that's, that's one issue. The other issue that I know took place in Florida was people having to go to locations that were so far away that it was, uh, it was difficult for them to get to. Okay, in Florida. I'm writing this down, that's why I'm looking down. Um, our I appreciate it, thank you. To uh, vaccine locations that are just really far and difficult to access, right? Yes, they, they basically, uh, one person said they were unable to get to the location, so they had to cancel their, uh, their appointment. So these are for pre uh, individuals with disabilities uh, with visual impairments. Correct. Okay, I have to cancel because, okay. Well, I'll do what I can do, um, I will, so as it turns out, this working group that I'm on, um, we talked to F 
FEMA and CDC, and it's a national FEMA office, but they have uh, a number of regional offices. So I could just tell them that uh, I had a conversation. I won't use names or anything, but I had a conversation with some individuals for ACB, and uh, these were some concerns that were raised, and uh, they will very likely look into it. So thank you very much. Yeah, I will. I will do that. Let me write this down so I don't forget. Talk tell this. Okay, area uh, phone number ending in six one three. Excuse me. Hello. My name is Jane Perry and I'm from Falmouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. And I want to go on a different angle, if I may. Okay. Um, I retired 16 years ago from the hospital here in Falmouth and I've been a healthcare professional all my life. And I was the first visually impaired employee at Falmouth Hospital and also the first visually impaired person in my profession. My question is, how can we help get to educate, which I do all the time, about healthcare professionals, people in the hospitals, how to deal with us who have a vision impairment. Do you have any kind of like manual educational tools? If not, first of all, how do we contact you? Second of all, is it something that I should start with my own Massachusetts State Secretary Fetters on the Health and Human Services side or the Elder Secretary of Elder Affairs? because this is a very big issue in the doctor's offices, the forms sitting in the office, when you come with somebody to fill out the forms, which to me is a is violation of my privacy after I filled out and signed the HIPAA form. So I'm looking towards educating and helping you probably make some sort of manual that we can hand to the professionals as we go in the office. I will give you one specific problem that happened yesterday. Yesterday I went to my ophthalmologist and my own ophthalmologist retired three years ago. So he had somebody that was doing cataract surgery has taken over his practice. They have different people in the office all the time. First of all, I had to tell her to take my, could you please take my arm? I'm visually impaired, I can't see. And she says, oh, come on down here. Second of all, when I left, even though my sister was with me, she was in the ladies room, she gave me an appointment card. It was not in, in a black felt tip marker pen. It was in pencil and also I could not see it. So I took out my little portable um, recorder, my talking calendar, and I recorded it. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm putting in my next appointment. Thank you very much. So that's my concern is how do we educate these people that are supposed to be taking care of us and that deal with death and dying every single day or different catastrophes and diseases. Thank you for your time. And also how can we get in touch with you? Thank you. Oh, sure. Okay, great. Um, so how to get in touch with me. I, I don't know if ACB has uh, my email or uh, whatever, but I can give it out. Uh, happy to be in uh, there if you want to ask any questions. Uh, it's my name, bother.tarina at hhs.gov. So it's B like boy, A like apple, D like dog, A like apple, R like Ray, dot T like Tom, A R. E, e and like November at hhs.gov. I'm sure they'll just say that my email or someone can do that. But yeah, happy to be in uh, touch if I can help in any way. Uh, with respect to your question about how can we educate more people about these important issues, that's a great question. And boy, I think that's a critical one. I think um, there is an organization actually uh, that specializes in this. They're called the ADA National Network. And what they do is they're, they're partly funded by the federal government, but they specifically specialize in a lot of these specific disability issues and they give presentations. So they're a great resource uh, to, to contact for maybe, because they probably are more likely to have those particular kits. I don't know if we have a specific kit on uh, assisting patients uh, who are, or any, or any individual who comes in who has a, a visual impairment, but I think ADATA, uh, the ADA National Network, I should say, uh, would have would likely have that. So that's a great resource too, uh, in addition to us. Um, but yes, thank you so much for your question. And I, perhaps if I get anything from, this is Pat Sheehan, from your leadership list or whatever that I, I can pass on to you, most people in ACB may know how to reach me. So it might be another way for me to get inquiries to you, sir. Okay, Regina. Hi. I want to thank you for this presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm going in the direction of telehealth. Uh, 
I am president of our local chapter and across California throughout all of our networks where I'm at, we are receiving multiple complaints of people that are unable to access the telehealth platforms with their doctors. They can't fill out the forms. I personally experienced that. I went to fill out some forms online and I had to get cited assistance. There was no way to fill out forms either in print or online. And it, it, it happens all the time. And then the telehealth appointments, sometimes you go to log on and they're not accessible. And one time it was accessible one week and the next time I went in, it was inaccessible. So mm. it's very frustrating. And they keep saying, well, we're rolling things out because of the pandemic and we plan to uh, address accessibility. Well, as you may know, that's a very bad way to approach accessibility. It needs to be in your brain before you roll out the technology because putting it in later can be expensive. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for bringing up that issue. We, we are seeing uh, telehealth accessibility issues happen now more than we certainly used to in the last few months. I know there's been conversations about it. Uh, we haven't seen too many, I think we've seen some complaints on it. Oftentimes it comes on the hip privacy side, but uh, the civil rights issue that you're discussing about accessibility, just being able to access your healthcare because the, the, the network or the uh, software or whatever it may be is not up to par. Uh, that, that could be certainly an issue for us to look into. So you, um, you know, encourage to file complaints uh, with us if, if uh, you know, in addition to with that provider as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a legitimate issue that we're seeing for sure. Thank you for raising it. Pat, our other panelists are here, so we've actually okay. run out of time. So. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you, Sarah, very much for your presentation. Uh, this has been an excellent session. Thank you. Thanks for having me.